Hey everybody, it is Jack Murphy and you are back on the Jack Murphy Live podcast, the flagship podcast of the Liminal Order. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Jack Murphy Live at JackMurphyLive.com, Jack Murphy Live all over the internet. Uh, today I have a very special guest, a return guest on the Jack Murphy Live podcast. Uh, his name is John Robb and he is an author, a military strategist, and a tech entrepreneur. Uh, his book, it's called The Brave New War, and it has proven to be exceptionally prescient and predictive. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that, and we're going to talk about uh, John's Global Gorillas uh, report, which comes out every month on Patreon. I suggest that you join it uh, and subscribe. I've been a subscriber for a long time, and you can follow John, John Rob on Twitter. It's at John Rob with two Bs. John, how you doing? Welcome back. Very good. Thanks for having me back. Uh, it's my pleasure. You know, the last podcast we did together was uh, so tremendously helpful for me and my listeners. I still get comments about that all the time about how how impactful it was. And, uh, you know, I've been following your Global Gorillas report, and that, too, is super helpful and informative. You're on the ball on a number of different important issues today, so I really appreciate it. Um, you know, we're just going to jump right into it today. Guys, if you if you want some more background on John, you can go back and listen to our earlier podcast that we did about a year ago. Uh, so we're just going to skip the pleasantries and all that and just get right straight into it. John, it's been a heck of a year. You've been really busy. What have you been focused on in the last few days here? I can imagine the answer, but why don't you tell everybody? Yeah. Um, you know, I've been writing the Global Growers Report for about two and a quarter years now. And um, uh, this month, I decided to do something a little bit differently. Um, I built a, a pandemic 2020 guide, trying to get beyond you know the kind of standard news that you hear or see, um, and uh, digging into some of the you know frameworks that would actually make it more comprehensible to people, um, kind of looking a little bit beyond the horizon, if I could. In terms of uh, the coronavirus and the global pandemic and the issues we're facing. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And uh, that's an interesting approach for you. So it's kind of uh, open source, right? I, I've seen that there are people placing comments and stuff, and uh, you're sort of collaborating with your subscribers, yeah? Yep. Uh, I put it uh, into a, a Google Doc, and I shared the link with my um, my supporters, and, and they're providing me feedback and insight. Um, you're, it's a pretty, pretty cool group of folks. I mean, you know, you have financial insight, they have uh, medical insight, they have, uh, you know, insight in, in terms of emergency response. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty good group to be able to tap into. And they, you know, if I do something wrong, they'll point it out, or they'll correct it, or they'll amend it, or add a little bit to it. It makes it kind of a, a very cool living document that uh, uh, people can use as a reference source. Yeah, and uh, this is a very uh, good example of uh, collaborative sense making and open source intelligence gathering. And I think that you and I both have been interested and focused on uh, how how do we individually and, and collectively as networks and groups uh, increase our sense making capabilities. And I think that this is uh, an excellent uh, example of how the power of a of a network can come together to to help not only the people uh, who are contributing, but then the readers and then your audience at large, too. So uh, how do you see that as it fits into sort of our general uh, war on, uh, you know, uh, confusion, information, disinformation, et cetera, and, and sort of building those capacities for sense making? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of articles out there that uh, point out that there's a lot more uh, false content being distributed, fake content, spun content. Um, and I don't really see that as a problem. I mean, because I don't really think as 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 an individual anymore. I think you know, in terms of a, my network helping me think through things. So, for instance, uh, if I find something that I think is credible and I think is interesting, I'll post it on one of my different feeds, and I'll, my network will tell me whether or not it is. There's somebody on the network that that has more insight into that issue than I do, and they'll 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 set me straight, which is great because that means I'm um, I'm not just one brain. I'm thousands of brains. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm as good as the quality of my network. In other words, right? Which is uh, an interesting point. Uh, you know, after we talked in in March, um, and uh, my conversations also uh, back then with Jordan Hall. 
um, they helped me so, uh, come up with the idea for the liminal order. And the liminal order uh, is working in very much the same way that you've described. Uh, and in fact, one of the one of the key lines in my sales pitch for people is that we're only going to be as powerful as our network moving into the Correct. future. And uh, this is a very interesting example because uh, in the liminal order as well, we have a dedicated coronavirus room. And we've had about 30 guys doing you know, just 24-7 open source Intel work, guys from finance and healthcare and, and health professionals, doctors, investors, uh, people who are experts in uh, trade and global logistics and whatnot. And yep. we, we have just been collecting information from all over the world. And, and it put us, we think, really far ahead of the curve. Uh, and people have been in defensive financial positions and being very uh, aggressive with their their health and the contact that they're making with other people in in preparation. Uh, and so it's it's fascinating to me to see how the, those conversations that we had a year ago actually led into something very productive that's working in the model that you've laid out and others uh, towards uh, being individuals being only as strong as their networks. And so uh, congratulations to you. And and I find it personally just fascinating and i've been reading everything that you've been putting out and so i I wanted to dive in uh actually i want to dive into the the corona for sure but i want to back up just a little bit because i know we can get bogged down with the corona stuff and yep one one of the things i wanted to talk about before we got to corona details um was your report about the sanctuary cities and what I really appreciate about your uh, analysis there was that it was not uh, left only or right only. And uh, I was wondering if you could sort of describe uh, for the listeners, uh, you know, that report uh, specifically around the Second Amendment stuff and the the immigration stuff. So if you could explain sort of the, the decentralized, uh, you know, effect that's happening and in, in, in relationship to sanctuary cities and our federal state and federalism, uh, et cetera. Okay. Well, um, the idea is that you know, as we globalize, uh, the legitimacy of the nation state, in this case, the United States, is diminishing, particularly as it, it screws up a lot of the things associated with globalization. It screwed up 9-11 by invi- invading Iraq and it and delegitima- delegitimized itself by promoting WMDs um, and not being able to successfully conclude uh, Afghanistan, for example. Um, and then, you know, the financial crisis, you know, again, a globalized financial system uh, having its way with us and, and not being able to handle the aftermath of that successfully by punishing uh, the fraud that was rife in the system. Um, and states and localities are trying to find ways to uh, adapt to that deficit. And they have more legitimacy than the nation does. And that's cropped up in a couple places. Um, there's the sanctuary cities movement began on, on the immigration side and uh, mostly from the left in terms of trying to uh, undermine any kind of uh, immigration enforcement. Um, and there were ways of doing that and the and, and most successful way was to uh, exploit the loophole, exploit the, the uh, federal systems of uh, approach to enforcing it. They, they use civil laws instead of criminal laws because they're easier to, to um, move forward within court. And um, civil laws can be ignored by the, uh, the states. They don't have to, you know, they're not obligated to act as it would be if there was a, a criminal enforcement action taken against an illegal immigrant. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, they were able to, you know, pump up uh, the idea that uh, uh, Immigrants in, in California and Chicago and other places um, can't be detained because of that uh, kind of it, that kind of constitutional uh, right that they have not to be uh, unlawfully detained, uh, and uh, and that's been pretty successful. Uh, it's spread across the country. There's lots of places to have it. There's been a kind of a an opposite um, movement from the from the federal side to uh, empower. Uh, states and counties to actively enforce on the federal government's behalf uh, immigration law, uh, kind of deputize them in ways that they wouldn't wouldn't normally be deputized or you know capable of acting. So kind of a counterweight, and you know that kind of template then served as a 
a, a, a way to radically expand the, the Second Amendment protests. Uh, right. I mean, they basically said, hey, man, if that's working, Sanctuary Cities is working. You know, it, uh, let's, let's apply it to uh, Second Amendment issues. And we have a constitutional issue that, that we feel is not being uh, improperly handled by the federal government. And it took off throughout uh, Illinois and then it went into Virginia. And now it's gone national. Uh, and again, you see this state and, and, and local level kind of disregard for federal law. I mean, basically, they won't enforce it. Um, and it's are not there, so much. Excuse me. Are, are there precedents for this? I mean, it seems to me that it's like, wow, I mean, we're disregarding federal law. Uh, to me, you know, if you if, if sort of a, a non-contextual analysis of that would say, well, you know, the federal government's falling apart. We can't even enforce federal laws or protect federal civil liberties. Is this a is this a new phenomenon where local jurisdictions are just saying no to the federal government? Uh, in the in the last forty or fifty years, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's it's always been kind of a struggle between the states and. Um, the, the feds. Uh, right. You'll see a lot of this, though, prior to the Civil War <laughs> in terms of enforcement of, of, of what the Supreme Court was saying, and what the federal government was saying in terms of how how uh, slavery should be handled. So there was you know, like, go ahead. It's, it's very interesting to me because I want to I want to at one hand criticize the sanctuary, you know, lo- localities, sanctuary cities and counties uh, for for their actions. But then at the same time, I fully support uh, the Second Amendment sanctuaries uh, and their disregard for the mandates from the federal level. So it's a, it's an interesting place to put yourself um, sort of tactically, I guess, where you can't really criticize the sanctuary uh, cities on immigration uh, while at the same time championing uh, the Second Amendment guys. Um, but but either right. way, this is a, an example of how this the power that was centralized in Washington seems to be wrestled, being wrestled back by by the localities. Is this trend you think going to going to continue and and what is it being driven by i think you know we both know the answer but i'd love to just explore it a little bit uh what is it what is it being driven by and and where is it going what is this going to lead to well um all of this really cropped up after the end of the cold war and um the kind of unanimity and singularity of purpose that we had during the cold war in order to win it um was no longer needed you know, the extraordinary measures that, you know, the extraordinary powers that we gave the federal government um, and deference we gave them uh, in order to uh, win that conflict uh, was no longer justified. Right. And the states are starting to do what they used to do. And they're starting to diverge. Um, and getting back to where the U.S. spent the first 150 years of its history is in this kind of grand experiment where there's thousands of different experiments going on and how to live. Um, and that's uh, that's unsettling to a you know kind of our modern kind of uh, way of thinking of things in terms of this like singular strong unitary state that kind of dictates to you know all the localities. Uh, I, I think that actually the this divergence is actually good because um, really none none of us know how best to live in the modern world and, and having a lot of different experiments going on at the same time is 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 a good thing. Uh, right. We've we talked about before about how the complexity of the modern age, you know, makes both expertise and acting like you're an expert or even in, you know, implying that you have an answer, one person or even one, you know, small cabal of people that that's sort of nonsense and out the window. Uh, I remember we discussed before about how it has to really be an iterative process of almost trial and error. And I guess by having independent networks uh, across the country giving things a a run and seeing how it works and you know sort of testing new ground Uh, in the long run you think that's going to be a healthy thing for the for the union or do you think that perhaps uh, we're on a divergent paths that this this new process is only going to accelerate especially with the technology involved right well i I think we 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 have a flexible document in the constitution and it can allow us a a great degree of uh, flexibility in how we move forward um you know this is a kind of a generalized model for handling uh complex problems we may, we live in a comp- complex world it's different than complicated complicated is more engineering specific 
solutions, you know, where we have all the factors and we know how to engineer a solution and we can we can build it using a bureaucracy and plan for future events using a bureaucracy. Uh, when you get to complex, uh, things change constantly. And the plans that you had in place or the system that you just built can be obsolete the moment you ship it. <laughs> and, and and if you restrict your, uh, your options to just one or two expert solutions, you won't have the one that actually works for this new situation. And, um, you know, when you're doing this at a company level, what you want, to, you know, you have a facing a complex um, market environment and you have uh, a couple expert solutions and they, they may, may or not may or may not work. Uh, what you can do is, is open it up to the employees and, and the ones that gain a lot of traction, you know, have kind of like a hubs of support for them um, are the ones you want to trial. And uh, not just brainstorming things that go up on a, a wall, but I mean, the solutions that actually gain some kind of traction with employees as a, as a solution for this problem. And we're, we're kind of doing that at a macro, macro scale with states and localities going in, in their own direction, trying to find the, the best way to not only survive in this environment, this complex environment, but to thrive. Right. Uh, I've been reading a little bit about uh, industrial organization and the future of professional work. And um, the, the author's name is escaping me right now, but I think he had similar ideas. Um, I think the book is called uh, like reinventing organizations or something like that. Um, he had ideas about how uh, work should be um, sort of atomized down to smaller and smaller group levels uh, with, with sort of general mandates and then allow each of the small pockets of employees uh, to figure out what works best. And then they can then, you know, select from best practices there, um, which, which reminds me of something that you wrote about in your, one of your reports on China and talking about how um, the, the answers to these complex problems are on the, in the edges and in the edge cases. Yeah. Uh, and and unfortunately, also on the edge is is closest to chaos, to chaos, right? right? So in some ways, we have to facilitate and expect uh, chaos. Um, how does that work here in the United States? Is that working for us? How is that working in China? What what have you seen as it relates to you know needing needing to have people on the edge edge cases in order to come up with solutions for complex problems? Well, I mean, we saw a pretty amazing example of of that with China and the coronavirus. So the um, during the first month, uh, when doctors were discovering, you know, infected cases and getting infected themselves, um, they tried to raise the alarm and they were shut down. I mean, the the government, um, the local governments in, in particular were the ones who are saying, hey, if you talk about this, we're gonna put you in jail and right. lock them up. And uh, by the time the uh, virus got, you know, got to a, a level where uh, it was picking up attention at the national level, it was out of control. And, you know, all those people died as a result of that. And we're, we're, we have a global pandemic as a result of not being able to, to have those kind of edge voices. And in the States, we're seeing it, 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 you know, in an interesting way with the way we're discussing solutions to the pandemic right now is it's, it's very chaotic, um, but you know, a lot of information is being developed and discovered the whole problem space is being un unearthed. Um, there's some disinformation out there, but that's fine. It usually is debunked if we think as a network, right? Um, there's some expert or somebody mm -hmm. who has some insight that would probably debunk something that comes across your your feed that's that's wrong. And then um, we're, we're we're actually running a decentralized response right now, um, right. and it, it we'll find out what works and what doesn't work in the mitigation space. Um, I think that's a more robust way of doing it because it, you may get it wrong if you did it in a centralized. Maybe the quarantine approach is actually the bad way to do it. Interesting. So what role does the central government, what role does Donald Trump have in this? I think people have been criticizing him for like taking sort of the, I remember when George Bush after 9-11 was like, everything's fine, just go shopping, right? Right. Um, and, and Trump's like, hey, it's just the flu, don't worry, not a lot of people are going to die, everything's going to be okay. Um, what, what, is, what becomes the role of the figure, the, you know, the leader of the biggest centralized effort that there is, right, the federal government? Right. Um, when at the same time, uh, the, the answers that are being sourced uh, in an open source environment and a networked environment like we have here. Right. Well, um, I'm working on a, 
kind of a, an idea as to what should be done at the federal level government level right now but I mean it's not like this is our first rodeo with this I mean we had 9-11 and the uh, you know economic crash that followed that then we had the financial crash and the you know economic crash that followed that and we had inadequate responses by the feds in both instances now we have this and this is you know going to cause a, a severe economic dislocation I mean recession on the edge of depression is going to be really bad I mean when you see empty flights and empty empty uh, tourist locations and, and people aren't going to conferences and the conferences are being canceled, it's going to have a, a bad, bad effect on the economy. So can we, what can we, we actually do? drill drill down on that for one second? Yeah, sure. Um, so your predictive capabilities are well shown and well proven. And uh, you're a very serious guy with a very serious background. And I know you take your work very, very seriously. So when you are telling me and now everyone who's listening that the potential economic dislocations go even perhaps beyond a uh, quote recession and veering towards big D depression, um, I think that that's going to get a lot of people's attentions. Can you um, sort of drill down on on that and what's driving your analysis there? Um, OK, OK. Because, uh, you know, that's that's pretty heavy, John. Oh, OK. Uh, well, um, we're seeing it in the, you know, in a visceral sense in all the closures and empty flights, uh, shutdowns of conventions. I mean, conventions in, in many uh, cities across the country are, are the lifeblood of the city. Right. I mean, and all the businesses associated with, uh, you know, servicing that that need. Um, and then. That I mean, that's just that's the that's the front end of it, and it this is of indefinite duration. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, we assume that it's probably going to take a couple of weeks, but it, that's not all the indications I'm getting. Is that it looks like it's going to run for another ten to twelve weeks in this cycle, and then be back again in the in the fall in the second wave. Right, um, and that kind of closure, that kind of dislocation, economic dislocation at this level uh, will have debilitating effects. You can see it on the individual level where a lot of people are just, you know, losing their jobs outright. I mean, you know, we don't need you, particularly in the kind of, you know, retail uh, uh, service industries where, the, you know, where you don't have the kind of protection a, a salaried employee has, you know, you're being cut. Um, and uh, a lot of cities and, and local governments are thinking, hey, uh, how do we cash in on, on all this sick leave that's coming up? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, do we have to pay for that? Maybe we can, you know, we're, we're going to have some problems with tax, tax receipts going forward. Maybe we can uh, recoup some of that by uh, putting the people on, on, on indefinite leave. I know in the airline industry, they're going to riff everybody and, and it will be the standard uh, uh, you know, when we start hiring again, we'll we'll bring you in based on your line number, right. and that could that could last you know two three years, and and I've seen that happen in the airline industry quite often. Um, tourism is a big industry; it's like what ten percent of the global economy. Yeah, yeah, and, I just saw and, numbers like twelve percent. Yeah, yeah and if you look everywhere, it, it's done. Cruise is done. Um, now, every company I know is also cut travel budgets to zip. Yeah, and offices are closing, travel uh, budgets are closed. I mean, uh, South by Southwest <laughs> was just canceled. Right. Uh, you know, that's 100,000 people, $350 million going into the city of Austin. That's not happening. Uh, and every day, I mean, every day there's n more uh, more uh, closures. Now, um, with the financial crash of 2008, that was like a, that was a – a, a real hit to the economy in that, you know, the lending stopped and the, the velocity slowed and investment then, uh, you know, ceased afterwards and the real estate right. market just completely crashed, et cetera. Um, which to me felt like, yeah, there was a global crisis, but it also was like a fundamental economic issue. Right. Um, is, is this, th this to me seems like a, an outlier event that's not actually representative of the economic fundamentals um, am I wrong in thinking that, that oh, this no, is something no. that can be processed or, or I, I think, I think that the thing that, uh, unites all three events is that it's based on uncertainty mm. and uncertainty is like poison. It's like, a the, the, the most aggressive acid on, on any kind of investment and, and confidence and confidence is the thing that drives markets and it drives economic behavior. Yeah. Um, and if you are uncertain about your future, 
uh, you know, both the, your health future as well as your economic future because everything's closing and, and you're not, you're, you're battening down the hatches because you don't want to uh, um, get exposed to anything. Uh, right. it, 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 it has to have a fundamental impact on, on the economic system. Um, I mean, there's, there's ways around it. I mean, I, mean, I was writing this morning about you know, the opportunity for say, for, say for Trump, if he wanted to, um, is to kind of rewrite the the whole equation about uh, stimulus. Now, right. We, we've been going the kind of, you know, stimulate companies and bail them out route for quite a long time. Um, it doesn't really stimulate much. And we saw that after the financial crisis, it, it's really, it takes forever uh, to recover from these events. Um, based on the way we've been stimulating and, and we're in a unique situation right now where we have you know 30 year bonds trading at you know percent and it basically the global financial big pot of money is throwing money at us and said please <laughs> please borrow from us right. and if you you know really want to stimulate the economy an emergency like uh, universal basic income thousand bucks a month for all adults uh, would for two years to get us out of this, um, not perpetual, not a lock-in, not a new kind of social program in that regard, uh, right. would um, would zoom the economy, and you could you could pay for it for two years for a little over forty billion a year, and then repay it in thirty years. Yeah, see, so repay it and repay the, the the original amount of a little over four trillion in thirty oh, years right, right, with right. an economy that's was vastly larger, and right. then also after inflation events because of the growth that you're going to get. Right, so right. you couldn't perpetually borrow at this rate once you start doing this. Um, almost all the projections I've seen uh, where you don't have to raise taxes in order to pay for it uh, give you extraordinary growth. We could have 8 to 10% growth with a, with a UBI. And so we, in the first year, we'd, bu bu we'd buffer and, and help people get through the pandemic uh, intact so that we reduce the bankruptcies, uh, keep people uh, spending and more confident. And then when we uh, come out of it, this either this fall or the year after, uh, with the second year of UBI, bam, the economy just zooms. And we have a really strong, robust economy uh, right out of the gates, uh, giving us, you know, getting us not only back to where we were, but well beyond that. Um, I think that's a pretty interesting, I mean, if, if Trump did that, man, he'd just walk in and in November, it wouldn't even be, that people would forget the whole pandemic problem it'd be like oh my god well that would be a, a completely like wholesale change uh in the way that we've handled financial crisis and other crisis in the past i think uh and it would be amazing to me and in fact if if he did do that and you look back in 20 years uh that would be just a, a, a monumental actual change uh in the way that we perceive each other and the economy and the bailouts i think i think the 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 opposite case hand out you know a trillion dollars to your corporate buddies and uh and hope that they don't just dish it all out in bonuses uh is a is a failed a strategy that uh, didn't have the a desired outcome well at least not the the outcome that the citizens of the united states the united states wanted uh perhaps the architects of the bailout got what they wanted uh, but in this case, it would certainly uh, be in the same vein as a, a quote unquote populist solution, uh, giving power to the people here. But, John, this this seems to me to be a dramatic response. And I don't know that we've made the case yet uh, in numbers in terms of uh, what the crisis is going to look like. Do you have any estimates on what this could do to unemployment rates, uh, GDP growth, uh, inflation in general and inf investment rates like are, if we don't do anything, are we talking about 15% unemployment all of a sudden? Are we talking about, uh, you know, GDP going into, you know, negative two, three, four, five? Like, w w what's going to happen if we don't do anything? Um, this is pretty unique. I mean, when we get to quarantine or quarantine or not, um, I mean, you look at China and its quarantine, it has had a devastating effect on its economy. People just are locked in their apartments. And quantifying that using, you know, based on the Chinese experience is tough because they don't share the numbers. Um, we're at this point in the, we're at the, the point we're at in the crisis right now can go two different directions. Uh, we could end up in a quarantine, which I don't think is going to happen given the, the way the feds are, are, are running it, um, which shuts down virtually all economic activity in, in big regions. Um, 
And if those regions are in, unsuccessful in, in containing the virus, it, it could go national like it, they did in Italy. Um, the other option is that it keeps on running and, and we see shuts downs at the, uh, the local level and those continue and basically all schools go online. Uh, you know, all travel crawls to a stop. Um, all of this kind of activity that we normally see in, in the, the economic system uh, dries up and people uh, start holding back their, their, their incomes and, and in fear that they may uh, not have that income in the future. And I, I, I don't know what the economic impact of that is. I, I do know that it would be horrific. Uh, and I, I don't, haven't seen any modeling that would suggest exactly what would happen. Uh, wow. We're in uncharted territory. I mean, this is a, I mean, this kind of, the interesting thing about this, this pandemic is a, it, it's not just like, you know, the, the Spanish flu um, and how it spread. I mean, this thing is going across the world at a, at a, at a record pace. It's, and even if you eradicate it in your country, it's not eradicated around you. It can come back and, and, and spread just as quickly as soon as you lift a quarantine. It's a, it's a it's a it's a wild thing and and it, because it's unique you know a modern economy experiencing this kind of event um uh, raises a, the situation to a level of uncertainty that it has to be suppressive of, of economic activity you can see it already in the finance financial markets the uncertainty is causing all sorts of instability right um i mean you could see it in the in the rate for the 30-year Treasury bond, right? I mean, they expect us to do very, very badly <laughs> if they're yeah. expecting a one percent return over thirty years. So yeah, it's the first time the yield curve's ever been entirely under one percent, as far as I understand it. Yep. So the expectations of everybody is that we're going to get clobbered, and that, and we're going to get clobbered for a long time. Do you remember when inflation was the big thing everybody everybody was yeah. wor worried about? Uh, you know, since 1981, uh, the inflation uh, expectations and scares have been pushed into the background. And at this point now, it's just like, please, everybody take all the money in the world and spend it. And we still aren't going to have any inflation. It's uh, interesting to consider this current uh, event in the context of like the, the deflationary, you know, generation era that we're right. in basically, right? Like last 40, 50 years. But no one's spending it. That's the, the crazy thing is that here we're having people throw trillions at us, tens of trillions if we wanted it, and we're not spending it on anything. It's based on, you know, we have this kind of old model of thinking about, uh, you know, how you'd repay it and, uh, you know, getting locked in and, and, and the like. I mean, if somebody offered me a trillion dollars at less than one percent as a you know as a business man i mean i would say okay i would take it a second and then i would invest it in ways that would yield incredible returns i right. mean it's just like it's it's if dumb money is thrown thrown at you, you got to take it i mean i've i've raised 50 60 million bucks in the past and it, it, if it was as dumb as this i would have I'd, I'd be a billionaire or a trillionaire right now Right. It's, uh, and we're not doing we're not taking advantage of the situation. I, it's like they're everyone's just locked into this old way of thinking. And, and it just it's just mind boggling that the U.S. can't find a place to put a trillion dollars that will yield more than one percent. Right. That that is sort of an insane thing to think. Um, and but it, this actual trend has been going on for some time. As a matter of fact, the corporate balance sheets have been carrying so much cash they don't even know where to put it. And they're the ones who have their ear closest to what well, my metaphors are going to mix up, but the ear closest to the ground. There we go. Uh, and they're the ones who are like feeling the pressure constantly to return, uh, you know, rewards greater than just, you know, pass book, <laughs> pass book right. interest rates. Right. And they, they can't find a place to invest it. Uh, so I, I, I'm not entirely surprised that the federal government can't figure that out either. Um, but it does seem to me this would be a wonderful opportunity for uh, a bipartisan infrastructure bill that, you know, raised, you know, however many trillions to invest it in something that's going to yield long term, you know, dividends to the United States. Well, hey, man, if you do UBI, there will be enough people at the local level being able to pay taxes and do things that you get a much better infrastructure build out. I mean, it, it, what happens at the federal level is they start doling it out to the same, you know, crony right. businesses and, and, you know, 60, 70 percent of that ends up in the same, you know, super wealthy pockets and, and, and it, nothing against super wealthy, but they don't they don't spend the money, man. If you have a lot of one, one thing you find when, when people have a ton of money is that they um, 
they don't invest it in in things that grow at normal rates they end up um either locking it down to you know ensure that they don't lose it you know hedge 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 or you you gamble and it's usually the financial gambles because there's only only financial gambling you know betting at at the uh, uh, global market level is that is big enough to handle the kind of money that you have so we got all this lost money in the system right now and um it's just we put more and more and more of it every year into this kind of big casino slash hedging parlor and it's doing nothing well it's the only thing it's doing is generating uh, profits for wall street and the guys that make all oh yeah that, pa- that make all that paper um do you remember do you remember after 9 11 when uh, they sent out like three or six hundred bucks or something to everybody yep yeah, the, to me, I was a little younger then. Uh, it seemed to me like a crazy, far-fetched idea that seemed kind of stupid. I was like, "What's three hundred dollars going to do?" You know, for me, a and then in this whole global economy situation. Right. Uh, but uh, somehow today, it seems to make more sense to put the money in the hands of the citizens uh, rather than in the corporations, and then hope that the. Uh, I guess well, this would be a trickle up, trickle up economic <laughs> economics well, kind of right. Yeah, but think of it. Think of it as. Um can 230 million adult Americans uh, figure out better places to invest the money to get better returns over 30 years or you know, better better results based on that investment over 30 years than um, corporations? And I think they can. I, th- I think you know, they will invest in themselves. They will you know, improve their houses. They will uh, improve their education. They'll, you know, do things they'll invest it and it, it, even if it they even if they spend it on a say a vacation or or, or whatever it, it, it's still you know better spent than a lot of the things i've seen on the on the company side right and uh, and spending it on vacation would help the tourist and travel industry but interestingly enough uh that avenue may be closed off <laughs> as a way to rejuvenate the economy if right. people don't even want to go out of their house um what is a what is a leading indicator for us to watch uh, to see where we are in this cycle? Is it infections? Is it deaths? Is it uh, hospital bed utilization rates? Uh, what 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 number should we be watching to see if it's going up or down so that we can predict out uh, you know however many months to see if the thing is going to crest or not? Well, uh, there's the top level numbers: the infection rates, number of people infected, but that's gets screwy because uh, we don't have testing kits out there in any kind of sufficient number to actually test a sufficient number of people. Um, and it's also kind of screwy in the United States is that most of the other places that had you know, rapidly growing numbers had it concentrated in a single region or city. Um, and uh, it was a good indicator of when that city would overflow. Uh, because I mean that's a, that's when things start to really break down is uh, with this virus is that when the number of people infected uh, reach a point where it overwhelms the hospital system, overwhelms the, the health system in that area, uh, and they start to have to uh, pick who gets treated and who doesn't. Right. So yeah, it's like when eighty percent eighty percent of the people who get this won't have serious problems. They, they won't need to be hospitalized. Uh, it might be as little as a headache. And that's typically people, you know, below 50 or 60 who don't have any history of, you know, diabetes, cancer, um, yeah, respiratory transplant, issues. transplants, yeah, yeah respiratory issues. Um, so that that's a good indicator that the, the economy doesn't need to fully shut down. We'll still have people out there doing, you know, generating food and, you know, delivering stuff because those are the folks that would be doing it and they wouldn't, aren't going to be keeling over on the job dead, you know, uh, from from exposure uh what 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 yeah it's, it's that top level affection number and since we're multi-region um we have four different hot spots in the states um it's both all four are like a kind of international diversity spots uh where a lot of uh, uh, immigration has occurred mostly from asia so it's like a uh, san francisco seattle new york and boston um and it, those spots are actually where most of the cases are occurring and they're ramping up really quickly. Uh, when they get to a point where they overwhelm the hospital system in each of those spots, uh, then we have a serious problem. 
Well, from what I understand, our, our hospital bed numbers are like uh, on a per capita basis, like the lowest that they've been in in a long time. Yeah. Uh, in 1975, it was 1.5 million beds. And then there was a consolidation wave. Um, now we're down to like 930,000 uh, hospital beds, even though our population is 50% larger. Even more Im- important is the number of ICU beds. So we have an expansible capacity of around 90,000. And then uh, respirators. And, and then there's another restriction as servicing those respirators after they've had a, an infected person on them. Oh. Um, and what happens is that when the 20% who do get infected that need to be hospitalized end up in the hospital, usually in those, you know, that, those target demographics, uh, 15% out of that 20%, uh, you need oxygen and some um, lighter care. But so they have to be on, you know, uh, enriched oxygen environment. And 5% out of that 20% uh, it have to be put on ventilators. So that could be, you know, 5% of the t- out of all the people infected have to be on ventilators. And that's where everything starts to really, truly break down. Interesting. Um, and it, in, in Milan, here's this, the, you know, the stories coming out of the hospitals. I mean, Milan's a first world um, hospital system. It's really high end. It's the it's economic uh, center of, of Italy. And, um, you know, they, I've heard that they had twice as many doctors as the NHS does in, in the UK, you know, per hospital, is that um, when they started to get overwhelmed, they had to make decisions as who got the respirator. And they were basing it on efficacy. And so you have a younger person, say 25, with type 1 diabetes. Uh, their efficacy, you know, the efficacy of actually giving them a respirator was relatively low, so they denied them access to it and gave it to an older person that had you know a higher chance of surviving so it's like this is like the horrible nasty decisions that the doctors were making and they were like going they're getting sick and they're facing having to kill patients uh, and it's not a good situation to be in and you think you think we're going to be in that situation in the united states at some point soon here yeah it's really it's really close um most people would say that we're, say, a, a week and a half, two weeks behind Italy. But I think it might be a little longer because we have a kind of a multi-region situation going. Um, I don't even think, a, you know, as this develops, that even the you know rural hospitals won't be uh, that much better off because it, they're they're lighter on the equipment and lighter on the beds, ICU beds, and they're going to be swamped more easily. Um, I think if you know, it's really dependent now since. Uh, we're not seeing much action at the federal level. Everything's down to the mitigation level. And we have a kind of a unique kind of situation in the states is that uh, we're sharing information on how to uh, shut this down. Um, and uh, there's a peer pressure on, on, on shutting things down uh, that propagate this virus far faster than anyone else in the world. Hmm. Um, and uh, if we can do it at the mitigation level, that I think that over the long term is more flexible than the quarantine system. And we'll have less damage on our economy and on, and, and our society if that's the case. Uh, optimally, and this is where I'm, I'm trying to figure out this on my own, is because I don't see anyone thinking this through, is that, is that uh, about a year, if this lasts another you know, 12, 13 months before next year, next spring, where it kind of starts to die off um, for the summer again, is that um, our optimal strategy is to try to become as immune to it as possible because we can't shut down for that whole period of time. We can't quarantine for that whole, you know, right. 12, 13, 14 months. Right. Uh, and the way you do that and you'd wait without actually causing excess death is that if you have a mitigation strategy to keep your number of cases below what the capacity of the hospital system is, they call that down, you know, uh, cramming down the curve or pushing down the curve kind of thing. Right. But you don't want to push it to zero you actually want a lot of the people who uh, are, are not in the targeted category, uh, targeted demographic of this virus to get the disease and, and get the immunity. So that when it comes back in the fall, that they won't get sick and they won't be carriers. You get this herd immunity to this infection such that uh, in the future we're less vulnerable to this um, pandemic right so you know it's hard to actually you know keep it going at a level that's just below the level of the the hospital system um, 
I see. You see what I mean? I mean, it's, it's yeah. A that's tough a thing. very interesting analysis to make. Like, how do we make sure just the right amount of people get sick? Right. <laughs> Rather than trying to drive it, I mean, I don't think under, under a mitigation strategy we're going to able to drive it to zero, like a or close to zero, like a quarantine. So, could you, um, could you define what you mean by mitigation strategy? Okay. Yeah, there's there's four different. Uh, there's a lot of terms being thrown around, and, and for one, I could dig in, you know, based on the you know the most cogent experts on the on, on the topic. There are four different levels of response or uh, society can make against the pandemic, and the first layer is mitigation, which is mostly done at the decentralized level. It's social distancing. Um, it's companies saying you know, work online, go home. Um, it's uh, uh, events being canceled. It's people not shaking hands and not giving hugs to people they meet in the street, that kind of thing. Um, that's what we're doing right now. And we're working out all the ways in which to uh, in, you know, do that most effectively and then, and then kind of enforcing it a little bit through kind of peer pressure. Um, and that's moving at the speed of you know, online thought right now. And um, the second layer is uh, containment. And usually that is uh, travel restrictions for the most part. Uh, it's done at the governmental level, usually the federal. In, in, this, in the U.S. case, uh, it would be, say, nobody from China can come here unless they, or that first you could say nobody from China can come here directly, or you could say they could be have to be uh, put into isolation for two weeks. Uh, that can slow the rate of propagation of the virus. Uh, then layer after that is uh, isolation, and usually that's uh, connected to uh, contact tracing. And um, you know, investigative technique, and, and it, that means basically, if you have the virus, you're either hospitalized, or if you're not that sick, you're still isolated, uh, or if you're suspected to have the, the the virus because you were you had a, a contact, you would be put into isolation. Now that can be done uh, voluntarily, or in the case of what they did just recently in uh, in New York and New Rochelle. You know, with the National Guard around, is they have people that probably won't respect that isolation order, right? So they're right. going to put them in a facility and then put National Guard around it and say, "Don't move for two weeks," right? Dang. And then you have the the fourth layer, and this is the one. This is the quarantine, and this is when everything else failed, and you totally screwed up, and uh, everything's about to you know the wheels are about to come off the bus, and then you say. Everybody in this, inside this geography, this region, this country, uh, whether you have the virus or not, or whether you're exposed or not, it doesn't matter, your movement is restricted. And then, uh, you know, the way the Chinese did it, they put under, they put 915 million people under some level of quarantine. Wow. Yeah, it's an absolutely amazing thing. I mean, it, it's a scary thing because I, I don't know how they turn it off. They did it, this is kind of cool, is they, uh, they used a, what they called the grid, which is they had local leaders who were in charge of anywhere between you know, 15 to 20, uh, all the way up to 100 people. You know, they had to manage their contacts and manage, make sure that they got food and water. Um, and these grid leaders, you know, propagated on a decentralized fashion all, all the way across the country I mean, through the party apparatus. And then they had um, wow, yeah, cell phone apps that would tell you when you could go out of your house usually it's either every two days you would you designate one person to get a pass to leave and then go get food and then come back In some cases it was once a week you go out get some food and come back um, it's a it's a pretty pretty austere kind of thing it's like uh, very c centrally controlled yet also operating at the at the local level where you know every town was setting up its own like entry system and allowed to do that you know checking people for temperature and the like um that's a really harsh quarantine and then there's this weird kind of new middle ground that singapore started putting in place uh a kind of interventionalist kind of uh mitigation strategy uh, and where they're constantly peppering people with uh reminders to wash their hands and stuff, watching their behavior online using CCTV, you know, even calling people out and, and you know, physically and, and, and accosting them and telling them to change their behavior, constant testing, temperature testing in, in every location. So you can't like go into a building without being tested. And then, uh, dis, you know, social distance uh, maximization. They've been pretty effective in, in mitigating it. 
uh, mitigating the, the spread of the, the virus using that extra governmental add-on. But that that's a level of control that we probably will never see in the states. I mean, it requires a super competent kind of city level government. <laughs> I don't know of any city level government that could pull that off, let alone national. Right. So do you think that the, the mass quarantine, you know, possibility is, is definitely ruled out for here in the U S I, I wouldn't say definitely ruled out. Um, I think, uh, well, it's more likely if it does occur, it will be at the state or, or a uh, city level. Right. And then it will be, instituted by the state or city government and they could they could just say you know if it's new york they put a a ring around it and say no one in and out and then they have to figure out how to get the the supplies in and out uh it's going to be a mess and you know uh if the stuff leaks out like it did in italy uh, you know italy had this regional quarantine coming you know about to be put in place and the and the information leaked out and the north is full of uh, people from the south of Italy working there because the incomes are better. Um, and as soon as the information leaked out, they went back. They headed south in, in droves. Uh, you know that the quarantine was about to lock them into the north, and uh, it spread it throughout the entire country. And they said, "Okay, well, we're going to we're going to have to expand this quarantine to everywhere." Um, so if you do it wrong, you spread the virus everywhere. <laughs> and I'm sure nice. they went outside of the country too. Is you know, it's a uh, uh, it can turn it into a mess. What what sort of confidence level are we talking about here with these predictions? I mean, is this a 80%, 90%, 5%? Are we wild ass guessing here, John? Or is this, you know, you have a high, high factor, confidence factor here? Um, yeah, I'm pretty, I have a pretty high level of confidence that we're going to run into a lot of the stuff I'm talking about. Because, I mean, it's not like this hasn't happened in other countries just around us in the last month. I mean, I mean, China didn't just do that. It's not like right. we saw China do that. And it shows that there, this virus is serious and it's not just the flu. You wouldn't see a country, you know, lock down 915 million people and, and go through the problems it went through and it is going through for something that's just foolish, you know, uh, and you're seeing the, the same thing in Italy. I mean, they saw it because I mean, they put those things in place because they saw these hospitals overwhelmed. Right. And they saw, they saw people dying in the hallways, and there were stacking bodies. And they go, if this starts, if this keeps going at this rate here and spreads to the rest of the country, we're going to have millions dead. And uh, you know, in these target demographics, now I can see a lot of guys. I mean, you know, doing the Elon Musk, uh, you know, alpha male thing. It's like, uh, this is no big deal. It doesn't affect me. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to get sick. My chances of getting sick are really low. Uh, and if I do get sick, meh, you know, it's. It might be just a cough or a headache, and that's probably true. But if you care about other people who right. are older, I mean, right. I have you know, I have a mother, and you know, you know, a little older, and she's she would be in a vulnerable population. I have I have a daughter who has a, a type one diabetes, had it since she was two, and she's an operating room nurse. So I'm kind of I have I'm very worried that she's going to be put in the crosshairs on this. So yeah. I'm concerned, yeah. and I'm trying to take measures to make sure that they're protected and isolated from this to the extent possible. Right. Um, I, it's, it, it really, I mean, it, it, when you ask, when you see people say their level of uh, uh, concern over this, it, often it goes from two to eight or nine. And, uh, you know, you can see that all the twos are usually younger, you know, guys that like, you know, they're living pretty much alone. They really don't have that kind of fear. Uh, they're you know, having to care for people, um, you know, you know, and then you have the older ones who have kids or have, you know, with problems and they have, you know, caring for older uh, parents and the like. And it's like, okay, that that's when the fear goes up. And it, I, I can understand both perspectives, but um, I think the, uh, the more conservative approach is to, uh, you know, preserve the life and, and probably the best way to go. Right. I mean, I'm telling my kids, everything's going to be fine. Don't worry. You're totally healthy. You'll be fine. You'll brush it off. It's not a big deal. Oh, it's even and better for kids under 15. Yeah. Pew, 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 pew. They, they can't even detect the virus in those kids. Right. It's awesome. But, it's but like then the best that, thing but, news. But then they say, well, what about grandma? I'm like, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. So my mom, my mom is a, she's a medical doctor and now a hospital administrator. So she's right. like, so she's, she's, she's in the crosshairs. Yeah. She's in the crosshairs and she has a, she has a cruise scheduled in like two weeks. That's been on the books for like half a year and I'm trying right. to talk her, talk her out of going, but uh, she's not. Uh, well, the, the CDC already said that they would not recommend it anyone using, you know, go on cruises. They said, you know, yeah. that's kind of like a, 
a hazard right now. Most yeah. of these things, most of these big events are canceling because uh, people are doing, you know, voting with their feet, right? So you right. Know, when you lose more than half of the audience or most half the people on the cruise have opted out, do you continue to do the cruise or do you continue to hold the event? and do it as a as, run it at a loss or do you cancel it yourself so i think we're we're talking about uh, varying levels of um, of effect here right we're right. We're, we're thinking about uh, who's going to get sick who's going to get treated and who's going to end up dying there's that level and then there's the second second and third level effects of what happens to the economy and you know right. interestingly enough with the economy being so big as it is you know just economic dislocations lead to extra deaths as well too right right uh, and and then there's also the issue of uh, the medicine that we get from places that are under quarantine or aren't producing as much as they were before uh, have you seen any information or data on um, on insulin distribution and manufacturing. I understand that there's a number of insulin manufacturers around the world, but uh, most of the precursors come from China. Uh, and uh, that was one area in the liminal order that we were really focused on is what are these, uh, you know, second and third order effects going to be, uh, you know, do you see, right. you know, manufacturing disruptions like that, that are going to lead to additional distress, economic and, and medical here in the United States, especially? Yeah, I think that those are going to erupt on a um, uh, surprise basis very much the same way that a lot of people who consume masks and surgical gloves uh, were suddenly surprised in the last three weeks that they were all gone. Right. right. And um, we're going to find that across the board in, in, in a, a lot of medicines, particularly life-saving medicines. I mean, this is, this is like, okay, we're talking about things that the federal government can do. This is where the feds can play a part, a, a crucial role. Uh, it's a golden opportunity to bring medical manufacturing back to the states in a crash program and then keep it here because you could you, you have government spending on healthcare and that government spending on on uh, healthcare can be used to lock in place you know domestic manufacturing of these items these are, this is like a this is a safety issue it's a it's a, a, a national safety issue and it, it it would take billions to get it going but it could happen really really quickly um, and it would be a net positive to come out of this with you know more resilience and 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 uh, more capability to take care of ourselves uh, when the world disconnects because what we're seeing is huge sections of the world just kind of winking out and right. uh, it, you know if this happens again in the future and it will i mean <laughs> this stuff w will happen again um you don't want to get caught flat-footed or every time so this is like that's a that's a thing that trump could do right now the other thing would be the the, the ubi for the economic kind of cushioning effects so people aren't kicked out of their apartments or right. uh, in Italy, they, they uh, waived uh, mortgage and, and uh, rent. So they put a moratorium on that. They don't have to pay that. Wow. Um, because they didn't know. want people thrown in the streets. I mean, because they can't work. They, you know, what do you do? I have no idea how you put that into practice, but <laughs> that's an interesting concept. Uh, so, what, you know, to tie this all in with some of our earlier discussions, right. um, the... The, the grand strategy with China has been a failure, as you so eloquently put uh, yep. forth earlier uh, in, the, in the previous podcast and in, your, in writing and such. Uh, and uh, you remember I sent you also that uh, article, The China Shock Doctrine. Uh, yep. I, I ended up speaking to uh, the author of that, uh, Samuel ha Hammonds. He, he's actually, we recorded a podcast that's coming out pretty soon. And, and in talking to him, you know, he really emphasized how we not only um, offshored uh, sort of basic manufacturing, but then also like precision tool manufacturing right. and, and high level stuff, which disrupted the um, iterative process between manufacturer and engineer, which has really uh, hand handicapped our ability to produce important elements of uh, the manufacturing chain, as well as in, in uh, national defense and whatnot. And now we're seeing that uh, offshoring and exporting our uh, ability to provide uh, medicine and health care, um, all in the name of, of global trade and WTO rules and China's ascension and all of that. I mean, is this going to finally be the wake up call for people to understand that, uh, you know, comparative advantage isn't always necessarily the best, you know, best you know, rule to follow and that, uh, you know, exporting all of this stuff to foreign countries, the manufacturing is, is not always 100% going to be a positive and that there's a real uh, 
urgent need to like begin re onshoring all these various elements of our national security and our national health. Um, is this going to be the moment at which the, those tides, uh, you know, change or uh, do we still have that long road to hoe there? Well, um, you'd hope, right? <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, uh, Trump is pretty much just he's singular in, a, in his in, you know, focus on that. I mean, you look at Biden and, he, you know, he is go back to you know, way it was with Obama and the way it was with Bush, go back to the, the old open approach. Um, kind of a legacy of the Cold War, where we're the market of last resort for everybody, uh, and we'll take it. We'll take the losses associated with that, right. uh, because we're a leader and we have to do that. Um, so, a uh, return to the old order, going exactly the opposite direction, is is, is looming, right? Right. And uh, I, I just still don't see people fully cognizant of the fact that we're we're vulnerable yet i mean this is like again you got to take advantage of the the uh, the opportunities when they present themselves right so like free money take advantage of it uh, an opportunity to point out that uh you know we need to manufacture uh, medical devices and you know everything from masks and and gloves all the way through to uh key uh, ingredients that go into insulin and, and 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 the like here in order to protect us in case there's a global supply disruption, well, this is like the perfect opportunity to do that. And if right. you don't take on, you don't take advantage of the opportunities, we come out the other side. A lot of people die, things go wrong um, as a result of that, and people afterwards say, "Oh, they're focused on other things. They're not taking, you know, they're trying to recover, and they're not really even thinking through the, you know, the ways to stop it in the future." You gotta, you gotta strike when it's up, you know, when the opportunity is presented. You know, it does seem like Trump might be uniquely suited to to solve that problem, or at least move move us back in the other direction right now. And, and you know, it's funny for anybody that's followed or studied Trump for a long time. You know, all of this comes from his experience in the '80s in real estate in New York and when the when the Japanese bought Rockefeller Center like Japanese buying Rockefeller Center uh, and uh, that famous golf course in California and Carmel the name escapes me right now um, those those moments you know stuck in Trump's mind so so prominently that 40 years later you know he's still running and appropriately and but maybe even just accidentally on his part, his part but you know his whole his whole focus has been on uh, observing and understanding how our imbalances with uh, China uh, are a risk to us. Uh, and uh, it's just funny to me that it was born all those years ago uh, during the 80s in, yeah, in, his, in it, his New York real estate experience. It's so funny because, I mean, it, it, the kind of Reagan, uh, James Baker kind of approach to Japan was the kind of thing that could have saved us from this problem with China is that, I mean, when it looked like the Japanese were going to eat the auto industry, I mean, James Baker came over and said, you know, to the Japanese and said, hey, our trade deficit with you is 60 billion. Either you correct it through buying more of our stuff or you cap what you got. Yeah. If not, then we're going to cut you out. We'll find a way to make sure that you don't sell anything here. And they said Japanese willing to work. They were willing to manage the situation. And and we got a auto recovery. And now we have auto manufacturers here in the States that, that wouldn't have existed otherwise. Right. Um, and we had a total abdication of responsibility when it came to Chinese trade. Uh, it was it was like this kind of weird ideology that's like it has to be this way. You know, every there has to be like zero barriers. And, you know, that's the only way to approach things is, a, you know, kind of this neoliberal. Perfect universe. And, and it's never <laughs> that way. It's like it, everything has to do. There has to be a pragmatic element. I think that, you know, what's uniquely American in American philosophy is this pragmatism. If it works, do it. Right. You know, if you're locked into an ideology and it, it tells you that this is the only way to do things, you're probably, particularly in this age, in a post ideological age, you're screwing up. You know, there's no pat answers for anything. No, this is too complex. There really isn't. And you're right. It, it is. Uh, I do remember the late 90s uh, and the the just singular this obsession and, and no questioning uh, and of the of completely, you know, open borders for for capital and for goods and, you know, and for people in many ways, too. Um, and, and in speaking with Sam Hammonds from the Niskanen Center, he was he reminded me of how back then. Um, you know, there would be conversations um, amongst sort of the academics and elites ab about whether or not that this was a, 
a good idea. And I remember Paul Krugman said something about like, you can't talk about this stuff in public because we don't want to give the quote barbarians any ammunition. So there was even right. like a, a concerted effort to like, you know, suppress counter arguments to, to the whole strategy. Uh, and it really does seem to me that the, the, the politics of the United States from nineties, uh, the two thousands and 2010, all coalesce around this central idea, the neoliberal uh, ideas of, of lowering borders and such. And, and, and now we're really seeing all the negative impact of that. And I, I just don't understand, don't, I'm not sure to what extent the, this is uh, information has filtered into the general populace and into the general, you know, people in the United States. Um, you know, it's so some of it's so esoteric and obscure, and it's you know economics, and but people feel it, right? They feel right. it on the ground, right. and they're they're right. gonna feel it. The factory closed, and they're gonna feel it when they can't get their insulin. And so, uh, it, it would be wonderful if we could turn this around and uh, turn it into something positive that would continue this decoupling that we need to have, and the sort of reestablishment of our independent uh, self care. Really, this is what yep. we're, we're talking right. about. It's like independent self care, our ability to defend ourselves and our ability to, to take care of our own health. Uh, and and look, we're going to use that to transition into what, what all of a sudden seems a little bit mundane, which would be the current current politics. <laughs> um, you know, last time we talked and, and just observing your writings over the last year, you know, you're, you're very focused on the network um, political movements versus is the yep. established uh, political movements. Um, and you, could you just sort of give your assessment of what, what's happened with uh, the Democratic primary leading up into Super Tuesday and, and the coalescence behind Biden? And what do, you, what do you see there? And what does it portend for the general election, do you think? Okay. Um, can I, I'd like to just add something to the, the last point you were making before we transitioned. Yeah, it's, sure. just a, it's just a general philosophy about... Uh, kind of resilient in a kind of a connected world is that, you know, I started my stuff back with Global Gorillas about small groups of people being able to disrupt the uh, global systems. And, and, and that disruption would percolate and cascade throughout these interconnected systems. And uh, a lot of people thought, hey, that means that I have to become totally disconnected. I have to cut the grid, you know, disconnect from the grid and, and, and produce everything myself. And, and my philosophy on that after carefully thinking about it and trying out different strategies for uh, quite a long time was that um, you don't want to disconnect from the grid. You want to connect with, you want to connect to the grid or connect to the, the global system on your own terms. And it means that you've got to take, you've got to be in a situation where you can take advantage of all the benefits of being interconnected, uh, but you're not uh, vulnerable to, to situations when it breaks down. So uh, when it's disrupted and it breaks, you're not just, you're not destitute. You're not, you know, completely uh, prostate or prost prostrate. Uh, you know, you're not, you're not uh, uh, falling apart as a result of that disconnection. Right. And um, it's connecting on your own terms is, is, is key. It's, you, you get the best of both worlds. So like, for instance, I have just, just putting in a concrete terms, I have a, a generator and the whole house generator. So. Uh, when the electrical grid goes down, that's fine. My generator boots up. It's right. not that I'd want to have my house disconnected from the electrical grid. Right. This is relatively cheap energy, and it's like, <laughs> why not take advantage of it? <laughs> um, in volume, and I don't have to maintain all of the systems required to actually keep generating that amount of electricity. So right. all the benefits with a backup plan, with on my own terms, uh, and you know that's generally the same thing with life is you have to connect on your own terms if you feel that you know disconnection is going to wipe you out avoid you know just avoid set it up in a way that's not going to wipe you out right but our our connection into the global trade by our i mean united states into the right. global trade network was uh was absolute uh, yeah and it wasn't on it wasn't on there were no terms <laughs> there were no terms or or real forethought put into it i mean do you think in the do you think that those guys knew did they expect or do you think I, I'm just trying to gauge like the general level of cynicism or greed that was in play at that time you know I know everybody wanted those those hungry Chinese markets and you know got a billion new people to sell bicycles to or whatever uh, but you know 
nobody thought this through. Like we just didn't know at the t- at the time. I mean, the only people that were really complaining really loudly were like the black block people and like Antifa, which is really right. crazy to think back on now that, uh, you know, we've circled come you know, around 360 degrees in a way uh, with uh, with the protests there. But, uh, you know, yeah, it's it's pretty nutty to see that. We d- Al Gore was the one doing the heavy duty lobbying in Congress to get the China admitted into the WTO. I mean, and China almost single handedly is the one that, you know, accelerated global warming by 50 years. Right. So right. He, he obviously didn't like think it through is that you're transferring environmentally protected manufacturing to a to a place that just will lift all those restrictions and just do it as dirty as possible is going to be a bad thing. Um, you know, it's, it reminds me of how um, NATO expansion, you know how we expanded NATO up to the edges of the Soviet Union or Russia right. after the fall of the Soviet Union? Yeah. And it was under Clinton, and they traced it back. He traced his decision back to when he had a, uh, a group of people coming in to discuss ending genocides. Which is interesting, and then the, the, you hear this story. Is, no, is it, well, yeah. I just laugh because I remember Hillary Clinton constantly referencing Rwanda, constantly referencing right. Rwanda. Yeah, yeah, and they uh, he asked them, "What can we do to uh, prevent uh, genocides in the future?" And they said, "Expand NATO." All right, and so you know that was they're thinking through maybe the the Balkans crisis, and they were thinking, okay, if we had more NATO members, it would would have made a better response, uh, and uh, we. But what ended up happening is that kind of spur of the moment decision without any regard to what would, that would do to Russia's behavior. We expanded NATO right up to their borders and, and you know, radically, I mean, anyone who's a hardliner in Russia all, all of a sudden became right. The obviously, obviously right. we're correct that the U.S. was an aggressor. Right. Uh, and then we, that made trying to, not only did we screw up the economic transition to get Russia into the system, we screwed up the security transition based on a spur of the moment kind of thing. And, and you know, a lot of that was like trendy academic theories and, uh, you know, philosophies that everything is going to be interconnected and, you know, yeah, yeah, that has to be right um, without thinking through the consequences of disruptions and everything else. But you wanted to talk about to- politics, so we probably should jump. Yeah, we can do that. One last, you know, I'm not going to kill a good conversation just for yep. a, an agenda. Uh, what's interesting, actually, that popped into my mind just now, um, as a comparison, social media, right? It comes yep. out, everybody gets out there, starts screaming and yelling and, and exploring and expressing, as Jordan Hall says. Uh, and it seems like this is the natural course of action. This is where we should go. This is the future, yada, yada. Well, you know what? In the last few years, people have realized that actually doing all of your business in public and sharing everything in public and being 100% engaged in social media may not necessarily be the smartest course of action. Right. And in fact, and in fact, uh, breaking off from that giant system into smaller groups that are private uh, with high trust levels. Yep. Um, are are uh, more effective than participating in this giant uh, cacophony where there's a lot of uh, downside risk, and uh, it's an interesting parallel to to globalization uh, and the path that we took into uh, WTO and out of the 90s, and uh, now here we are considering whether or not uh, you know as a rule uh, those sort of open exchanges are 100 percent an essential good, and are there ways that we can do it uh, more effectively, uh, safe uh and uh maybe even cheaper um it's an interesting parallel actually that i hadn't yep. hadn't considered until just now but it does make sense like uh, market evolution evolution of ideas etc it's just uh the the, the consequences <laughs> from getting it wrong in the first place were so severe well you know the the, the breakdown process is, is is pretty chaotic i mean we saw that when the printing press broke up you know the catholic church and and feudalism and, and set in motion a, a series of changes that uh you know, built the modern world, you know, built science and built the, the bureaucratic state, built the uh, um, the global financial system as we see it. And um, all from that little printing press, you know, just, but the, you know, one of the big trends that we're do, dealing with now, and you're, and you're taking advantage of that, is the, the, this tribal thing, is that you're tribing up is a good thing. Yeah. Is that we're not solid, we're not individuals anymore um, like we were, 
after the printing press where we think in isolation, we, we learn in isolation by reading, and, and mm -hmm. then uh, we, we take a stand as individuals, is that we're increasingly part of a group. And that's kind of alien, but it, it's, it's more survivable in this environment. Um, you know, it, it, there's a, a lot of comfort in actually having other people around you that will, will back you up. And we all miss that. We all like, we all kind of want it. I mean, you, you know, it's this, it's just like this missing limb that until recently, you know, you didn't really feel because you didn't, you know, we're living in a different world. And now in this kind of more, a little more chaotic world, you're starting to feel that this is this phantom limb problem. It's yeah. like the lack of this kind of tribal context uh, that uh, helps you know stabilize your life, and that's not all done out in the open. On you know, it's not done through just friend networks, though. You know, friend networks and followers and stuff are great for vetting information and introducing you to these people. But these people that are this backplane is uh, is key to getting through this intact. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. This is basically one of the fundamental premise uh, underlying the the liminal order, and you know, John, we are. Uh, we have a hundred over 190 active members now in less, in less than a year. And uh, we are we are constantly discussing all these issues, whether it's a fourth generation warfare, we're, re we're rebooting our, our seminar on that. We did an eight week seminar yep. um, where we're looking at, uh, we're, we're doing like a logic class, like just how to think rationally and clearly. We yep. have an active sense making apparatus that's constantly processing information and, and crowdsourcing and putting it together into a useful and uh, actionable, actionable information. In fact, you know, our coronavirus room we were ahead of the market moves and many of our members uh you know took defensive positions and in fact we even have like fund managers um in our midst they they took defensive positions and you know the 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 sheer number of dollars that were saved just from the right. our sense making capabilities is so big i'm not even going to say it uh, on the podcast it's it's like unbelievably big yeah and uh, it's just it's absolutely freaking incredible to me um, that these kind of theories that we've talked about, you and I and me and Jordan and other people uh, now are coming to fruition in reality uh, and, and, and it's really happening. And the guys, it's not only just the sense making in the community, there's, there's a sense of actually like a community aid, mutual aid too. Right. Like we've had members in crisis and the whole, the whole squad, you know, rallies and chips in like 20 bucks and all of a sudden they've got, you know, two grand or $2,500 to like fix yep. something. So, um, you know, I thank you for those early conversations that we had. And uh, certainly the guys in the limo order are huge fans of yours. Oh, uh, and uh, they, uh, they really appreciate the work too. And so we're trying to be the living embodiment uh, to steal another word from Jordan about uh, change that we wish to see in the world today. You know, it's uh, it's very baseline stuff, but be, be the change and uh, we're doing it and it's, it's fun and it's out there and it's on the edge. And yet at the same time, it's so necessary and, and feels very wholesome and rewarding too. So um, anybody out there that wants to learn more, come check us out at the liminal hyphen order.com. Like I said, we have over 190 members, uh, mostly in the United States, but worldwide. Uh, and we've had meetings in New York, DC, LA, San Francisco, Denver, Nashville, uh, Austin, uh, and, and they just keep in Western New York, even that just keeps going. So, um, it is the future and I appreciate your contribution to that. So, but let's, uh, let's get to the politics part. I know people are going to be interested in that. Uh, I am myself as well. So what is your assessment, uh, in, in the context of your theses going back to brave new war, your understanding of the uh, network to conflict and network warfare, politically, political networks, the open source uh, politics that we find ourselves in. Where where are we today? What happened before Super Tuesday, uh, and what's going to happen moving forward? This is okay. So you know, my first thing when I started or when I started writing and in, 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 as a independent person on online and and with my Global Gorillas blog and then my book and then this, um, and I started focusing in on fourth generation warfare, and the premise behind that is that we were going reversing uh, the piece to Westphalia. We're going you know, to the, the era that existed before that, um, where the, the nation state was in decline. Um, but what, what we saw as you know, like this online world exploded is that uh, uh, it was more just a, a, a seminal event brought on by technology that was uh, 
setting in motion a lot of different forces, uh, creating new things and, and shaking up the old order. Uh, kind of uh, just like the, the printing press did, like we mentioned earlier, um, and that the the breakup that, of the nation state that we saw in the fourth generation warfare, the primary loyalties and the like, uh, developing as in opposition to that was uh, very similar to what was going on with the Catholic Church and 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 the feudal system uh, when when the printing press made it possible to you know start your own church. I mean, actually have a Bible in hand, right? Right. Um, so. Uh, what we're seeing now is some, you know, I've been talking a lot about networks and, and network politics. Um, you know, I started with this idea that there were three different networks competing, uh, that this network system, the social networking system, plus everything else associated with it online, uh, was a new decision-making system, a new social decision-making system. And we're just learning how to use it effectively um, to go along with, you know, markets and bureaucracies and, and, and kind of tribal cohesion, cohesion in, in the form of nationalism. Uh, those systems worked well up to the end of the 20th century and this one was being added. Um, so we were in the kind of training wheels phase of, or no training wheels because we we're falling over all the time. <laughs> right. And so, okay, so they have three big forces. Um, force on the right, force on the left, and the establishment. Um, and the force on the right it wasn't the kind of uh, classic conservative force. It was um, in this networked world, it had a different kind of form. It was uh, disruption. It broke down consensus or old consensus or old ways of doing things that were locked in place so tightly we couldn't even uh, address them because those assumptions were in, uh, not, as, you know, not questionable, right? right Stuff like right. trade, it's like, right. Of course, we're going to do this trade. Trade has to work this way, <laughs> or you know, <laughs> you know. Of course, it, it, we're not going to change anything having to do with immigration. Or of course, we're going to do this or that. It has to be this way because this is the way we've always done it. Um, and you see, like little versions of that, like Eric Weinstein's thing about the uh, uh, rat testing. And they wouldn't even change that basic little thing in the rat testing, even though it was, you know, shown that those rats were uh, biasing the results because it was such a core assumption. Right. and all of this other research and unraveling it was uh, incomprehensible right so uh so the right Just forget it <laughs> yeah the right formed kind of a disruption uh uh kind of little little chaotic at times but you know take those things on and they formed a there was a form of warfare that allowed them to actually uh do it successfully online kind of a form of maneuver warfare where you're you know, rapidly changing topics and and constantly attacking it from a variety, variety of different uh, directions and that was trump's that was a network that put Trump in office, and Trump was more of a conduit for making that happen uh, than the actual classic candidate in the kind of literary world. Um, and um, what the assumption was on my part was that there was going to be a challenge on the left, and the left wasn't uh, the classic, like, how much more government spending there would be. Uh, it was more uh, trying to set up a consensus. Uh, consensus that we can all agree on and consensus forming around a variety of just really basic gut issues. Um, and optimally, if you could form a consensus is that you can do other things as a group in the future. Right now, if you ask anyone, I mean, I did a couple polls on this and I have, you know, I asked, you know, what do we agree on as a country? <laughs> and nobody can come up with anything. <laughs> you know, they, I mean, like, we like potato chips or something, or <laughs> like football. But, but even that's not as 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 universal as it was. Yeah. So um, um, in terms of doing anything as a government or doing anything you know together, it, it's pretty much um, all over the map. So uh, what we need to have in order to work as a group, though, is 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 that consensus. And I was hoping you'd see some of that on the left. Like even if you, you know, most people, even if you don't agree with it, agree that you know healthcare should be some kind of a right. You know, we should have at least a basic level of health care for people. Yeah. You shouldn't be able to, just because you don't have a dollar in your pocket, you know, you shouldn't be uh, denied getting some basic health care. Yeah. Um, and um, if you frame it like that, it can, people can agree on it, and then you can start to build policy. But we have, we're not even getting, we, you know, we're, we've been talking more at the policy level, which is higher in the stack, and it's not, it's not something we can address. So what we had is like Sanders and Warren, and, and it looked early on that they were going to be able to do something along that uh, 
vein. I mean, Warren was great at these big sweeping moral arguments, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, mostly focused, you know, her initial work was all focused on the family and that, and, and family incomes and, and, and how it was impossible for them to get ahead because of these cost structures. And if she had based her, you know, sweeping moral claims based on that, she probably would have been a winner. Um, and the network, was could have formed around her, and what happened is that the uh, the network was divided into two pieces. It forked. Mm -hmm. uh, the network that was opposing Trump, the resistance, forked into two pieces. One in behind Sanders, uh, who was talking in more sweeping terms, using the night me us kind of label. It was it was had some good pieces to it, uh, but it was still tied to a lot of older policies. Uh, and then Warren was more particularist. Uh, she was in. She dived into the. Uh, uh, intersectional stuff right very heavily and um that was more divisive you know and that's not building that consensus and the civil war between that i mean whenever there's a fork in any network it's usually the most vicious war i mean it's just that they're they're constantly they're it's not reconcilable and that tanked the networked left's response to this election and so um the establishment which is a third party uh, uses their control over the existing networks, the legacy media, the, the uh, um, their mm -hmm. ability to to influence uh, governments and the like, uh, or you know, local, state and local level, um, uh, as kind of a bludgeon. Uh, well, they were able to consolidate based on their fear that uh, Sanders or uh, would take over the party, and then they were able to fight him off, and. Uh, it's been successful. So now we have a kind of a dysfunctional system. We have like a, an establishment candidate. And the problem with the establishment, just like the same thing that faced the kind of the Catholic Church right after the, the Reformation started, is uh, why do you exist? <laughs> you know, why are we uh, supporting you? And um, a lot of the establishment argument says basically uh, uh, we're not them. or uh, we, we can bring you back to where we were, um, or you know, in Biden's case, he says I'm more electable, and that's it. That's the extent of their entire argument. They don't they don't have anything to do, any direction they want to take us, other than back. Um, no real reason, no real grievance, other than uh, you know, opposition to Trump. Right. Um, right. So they're just a nothing. It's a big nothing burger kind of thing. It's a. Uh, so, you know, that's that's the situation we're in. It's like this empty establishment trying to rally around a candidate up against uh, the networked right, which still seems uh, vibrant. I mean, they tried to take them down through legal campaigns. Um, you know, all the, all the, you know, I was writing two years ago that, the, you know, all of this stuff wouldn't work because, uh, you know, the, the Russia, Russiagate stuff and then the follow on uh, uh, impeachment wouldn't work because, uh, Trump is immune to that because he's a he's a he's a conduit for the network. So they're not a you know if you attack the person, the person's really not there. <laughs> he's just the conduit for the network. So that every attack you make on him passes right through him. Right. You right. Know, and uh, and it's exactly what happened. Um, it wasn't a legal process. It was a is a, a way of damaging. It's supposed to be a way of discrediting or delegitimizing the target, and it didn't have the intended effect. And Trump ended the whole process up. The, what forty six percent approval, right. probably the highest he's been since the beginning of the presidency. Right. So, um, so now we're going to, coming up on an election where there's not a a, a network left is going to go sulk for a while and try to figure out what it's supposed to do, um, and uh, they may end up tanking it by not supporting Biden, uh, and then you have you know Biden versus Trump up in the you know establishment versus networked right. So that's my that's my nutshell. It's going to be interesting to see the ins and outs. Um, it would have been more interesting if the uh, network left had consolidated and taken over the Democratic Party as as decisively as the network right did with the Republicans. But um, they just weren't yeah. able. They just weren't able to pull it off. You yep. know, they just weren't able. Well, and and I, I would say uh, 
good, good. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, you know, partially because their, their moral compass is something that I find abhorrent and I find, uh, you know, incompatible with American values in general. Uh, and so, you know, from a purely academic standpoint, it would have been interesting to see how the Democratic Party would have been hijacked. Um, however, uh, I'm pleased with them running an establishment candidate who's basically Hillary, who's basically Obama, who's basically Bush, who's basically Clinton. And so it's a very easy campaign, I think, for Donald Trump to continue. Basically, it's just 2016 all over again. And uh, most of the factors that were at play, which drove Trump to the presidency, are still in play. Either they're uh, trends that negatively uh, were trending downward uh, that favored him, or there are trends that were negatively uh, uh, going negative that he has reversed, uh, which also then favor him too. So um, I think that there's a pretty good chance that he gets reelected. Uh, it will be interesting to see what the uh, Bernie supporters do. I do know that there were a number of people who, who supported Bernie in 2016, who then crossed over to Trump after the DNC, you know, the convention and all the nonsense that went on there. Um, and, and I've come to realize that that's because the network left and the network right have the same enemy, uh, right. which is the establishment. It's just right. uh, once you defeat the establishment, what you do after that is, is completely uh, different uh, policies. But, you know, the, the idea that we're controlled by a, a cabal of neoliberal minded uh, corporatists, basically from both the right and the left, uh, is is sounded before like a weird conspiracy theory, but it's so plainly obvious. Um, and all these issues we've been talking about today are a result of that cabal, uh, the China ascension, the global trade, the the denudering of our uh, military capabilities, manufacturing capabilities, and just gosh darn friggin' self help and medical care capabilities. Um, all of these are a result of the last four decades of basically unified uh, control, even though they both came from the right and the left. Yeah, um, it also points to probably what who the uh, next candidate to kind of replace Trump would be. Mm. It's a, I, I think right now it looks like a Tucker Carlson. <laughs> I mean, I mean, truly, he's really just he hits it. Like, for instance, bringing back medical manufacturing. I was thinking that I wrote about it and then I saw he had a show on that. It's like that's right that he seems to hit these notes constantly. He's got a better ear for it uh, than Trump. I mean, he's not as good at the disruption element and the change in you know, the fast transients, but I think he has a better ear for figuring out where that, where the pressure points are. But that's me. I mean, just, I, I think I don't see anyone else that can pull it off. I think you're, I think you're right. Tucker Carlson would make a fantastic candidate. Uh, he, he may be even better public speaker and orator than than Trump, the way he can get people riled up. Uh, and I do appreciate, and you know, he does have a network of people scouring all of social media, all of our right. work, your work. So uh, if you if you say something and, and two days later ends up on Tucker Carlson, there, there's a less than zero chance that they're, they're watching and observing and, and, and taking information from the Yeah, but the, see, the that's like kind of there. a formal, he's, he's formalized the process that of, of the network feeding the candidate. Just like yeah. Trump was an informal version of that, just what he happened to see, what he happened to pick up. But the, Carlson's actually formalized that process. He's looking for the good ideas to percolate up, up out of this open source network. It's pretty interesting. I mean, that's, a, that's the, you know, and exactly the opposite of the, of the left. It, the network left, it, at least the candidates that ran, I mean, there's no way Biden would look at anything on Twitter and take it as, as a good idea, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, or, or Sanders or even Warren, um, you know, I unless Warren had a lot of not invented here kind of thing. If she didn't come up with the policy, it's not, it's not good enough. Right. So well, I, th I think that the, some of those people on that work left did take a little bit of Twitter too seriously, which I think is the, the woke, the woke element, you know, right. when I, when they were all on stage and Bernie Sanders goes, America is racist from top to bottom. And, uh, and Elizabeth Warren says racism is everywhere and getting worse every single day. I'm like, wait, the only place they're getting that from is the intersectional left, the online intersectional left. 
Uh, it's because obviously not based in fact. Um, but uh, it is interesting to see how, um, you know, I call her mom, Amy, Amy mom. She fell in line. Mayor Pete fell in line. They all fell in line behind Biden, who is, by all accounts, clearly deteriorating right before our very eyes. He's not the same guy that he used to be. Uh, the cynic, the deep, deep cynic in me thinks that Obama understood this. They're throwing a sacrificial lamb out uh, to be slaughtered here and saving the Michelle Obama you know, campaign for 2024. Uh, you know, that's the deeply cynical part of me. And, you know, maybe it's right. I don't know. Time will, t- yeah. time will definitely tell. <laughs> yeah, even Yang folded yesterday, joined the Biden train. Yeah. I was like, whoa. Yeah. If I were him, I would have just sat it out. Right. It's... Um, it's very interesting to see what power gets wielded behind the scenes, obviously there. And it makes all of them sound like a bunch of hypocritic you know, horses asses because they just stand there banging each other over the head. And now they're like, this guy's the greatest. He should be president. Um, but, uh, you know, the 20s, they clearly don't believe it. Right. I mean, you're going, okay, he's a, he'd make a great president, even though you know, it, you know, it's not true. Right. I can't, I can't honestly, I can't understand some of that, but uh, I do know that uh, Trump versus Biden is going to be very similar to 2016. Biden, I think, is even less of a, a qualified candidate, not qualified, but a, a weaker candidate than Hillary was. Uh, and uh, I don't suspect the outcome is going to be any different. Interesting to bring up Tucker Carlson 2024. I think I could get behind that myself. Um, yeah, it tr- seems like a natural. It seems like a kind of a shoe and he's just he's got that kind of. It, and, and the way candidates are vetted now is that they're out in public running their own show. Right, right. Right. right? Well, That's where you start. Well, you, you got, build your you, network and you go from there. Yeah, you got to bring your own network. And you can say that about basically any industry at this point. Right. So uh, I've been able to do that with just content creation and, and, and being an author and a writer. You know, if you build your audience, then you bring that audience to other endeavors and people will then want to work with you. If you have yep. the audience power, uh, it then feeds on itself. And I could do a whole podcast on how to develop that audience power. Sometimes it's, well, yeah, it's that's not also, the straightest of lines. Yeah, that's also the way, way uh, you, you build is a small business now. I mean, you know, if you, like there's a classic example of, of uh, you know, jeans made to order. There was a little company that, that had these like small runs of jeans and they would do maybe 200 pair, right? And they were pretty unique. If you're buying them in a city, you'd probably be the only guy in the city with it, those jeans. And it had its own denim and its own stitching and everything else. But if they had to do it through manufacturing and, and you know, in the traditional way, uh, you'd take all the risk Right. And then you'd put it through the retail chain and the jeans would cost 300 bucks a pop. <laughs> and so what they did is they built a network of people yeah. who were interested in their jeans. And then they said, okay, who wants to buy this? Here, they describe it, they show it, they prototype it, and then they, people put up their hands. And if they got a certain number of orders, all the risk in the venture is gone. Right. And then they just produced it with zero risk, sent it out. If there were any extras, I mean, once they had the production volume up, other people would hop on. It was, it was a great way to run it. And, and, the same with almost anything that you know that thousand fan kind of thing sure uh, i think it's still you know about a thousand that you you need to kind of become viable yeah i mean i mean once you I mean, depending on how deep you go so deeper smaller number maybe a hundred uh if it's a lighter touch it's about a thousand uh so you know you think of what five billion people online and you need a thousand Right. Become viable in whatever niche you're focusing on. Right. So the, the the world of opportunity is out there. Scott Adams says we're living in a golden age. Mike Cernovich the other day said this is the, the greatest opportunity period of, of, of America's history. Um, you know, some people can look at the world today and think that Hitler's running the country and everything's falling apart. And this is the worst, horrible, most horrible place in the universe to live. The rest of us are thinking that it's a world of opportunity and a wonderful time to be alive. And there's basically nothing standing between you and whatever you want to do besides you're the only obstacle. So you just have to get out oh, there, yeah. get out there and do it. Uh, yeah. And uh, on top of this, we're, we're, we're in the middle of where the future is being made. I mean, we're running the biggest social experiment in the history of yes. mankind where we're trying to figure out how to live on the edge of chaos. Yes. And we've got a complex system that's constantly shifting. Every week, it's a new thing, right? Yeah. Every week, there's a new challenge, and, and things are just flipping 180 degrees out. And we're trying to find a way to actually live in that, on that edge where you, you get incredible opportunities and, uh, you know, 
incredible changes overnight and you got to be able to exploit them and, and take advantage it's an awesome time to be alive it's really amazing you, you know it, and also a lot of people just don't step back just a little bit and then look at your your personal life outside of online and you go i know i look at my my four kids and they're all doing great and i did something right with them and they're they're right. all pretty happy and they're successful and uh healthy and, and doing the things that they, they they love to do and you know i look at my domestic life and how that works and i got you know i you know, I, i'm very happy with that so why should i be upset online or about the world or you know i would like to see things differently and i can you know critique them but hey this is an awesome time to be alive it really is and i like what you said about uh thriving on the edge of chaos that that is uh <laughs> That is exactly right. And, uh, you know, the name liminal order is, is kind of nerdy. Uh, liminality is, a, you know, a transition time between two fixed points and offers a, a chance for, for um, sort of remaking yourself and coming out on the other end and, you know, bringing together the sense of liminality in which the, our society is in right now and some sense of order uh, to it is, is, is become basically the, the entire thrust of my life. And uh, it's a... It's a fun and interesting and exciting place to be. And the fact that we're having positive outcomes is just incredibly rewarding. And, um, you know, it, it all comes from conversations like this, John, and it all comes from, um, you know, being proactive in building networks and engaging and activating the networks uh, and trying to learn and refine and, and iterate as you go. Um, and as Jordan said, you know, the team that iterates the fastest, the, who Uda's on the Uda, uh, is going to be the team that wins. And uh, I feel like that we're, we're on that, that tip right now. And uh, it, a lot of that has to do with you and, and the conversations we've had in your writing. So thank you cool. very much. Oh, my pleasure. I really, truly appreciate it. Uh, and, one thing ahead. I would like to t toss in on the liminal yeah. idea is that it's, it's actually maybe a transition from the solitary man to the networked man to the kind of tribal man. You know, it was like moving from, you know, dealing with everything as an individual alone in the world to working as 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 part of something else. Yes. Where that those other structures now, you know, you have it that transition that, you know, solo, you know, world world of print and 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 isolation towards connectivity and and networks and working, you know. At, together to get problem solved. So, I mean, that's that transition, that phase transition that we're all in right now. Yeah. You know, whether people want to admit it or not, they're in that transition. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it, there's only a handful of people that even can articulate that at this point. Uh, and, you know, it's, it, these concepts are going to take some time to, to filter down into the general culture and our, our lingo and, general expectations of the world uh so to the extent that you guys the audience uh, members of liminal order that you're with us on this journey right now uh you guys are way ahead of the curve and uh it's a it's a good place to be super high value john super high value from you as always i've already taken up uh, two hours of your time so i'm gonna i'm gonna wrap this up and just say thank you very much um i really appreciate it everybody out there you should get should start with john's book brave new war you should become a subscriber to the Global Gorillas Report on Patreon. Uh, I've been a subscriber for a long time, and I, I highly, highly recommend it. Find John on Twitter, at John Rob with two Bs. Uh, and, uh, John, again, just thank you so much. And, uh, you know, I hope that we'll do this again very soon. And, uh, you know, let's stay in touch and just keep this thing going. I really appreciate it, sir. Oh, well, thanks, Jack. And I, I really appreciate the time you've taken to seek me out and get me uh answering questions <laughs> <laughs> it's my pleasure and uh, i will definitely do it again sir right. have, right. have a wonderful day take care you too bye-bye